of trying to figure out how to move forward and toward a more complete life to be holy as God is holy. And John Wesley, our founder, um, described this goal as Christian perfection and called us to move very intentionally with all of who we are towards Christian perfection to the end that we as ministers who are ordained in the United Methodist Church are asked if we expect to be made perfect in this lifetime. And if we don't say yes, we don't get ordained. Um, but... Right now, after we just finished that scripture, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, and I'm talking about do you expect to attain perfection in this lifetime, where are my type A perfectionist types that are freaking out right now? Uh, <laughs> who have already woken up this morning and have already been, I knew I should have gotten up early. Why can't you remember to get up earlier? You know you need to have this to get done to get on church in time. And when are you ever going to learn? Who's had that voice already going on this morning, right? Right? It's real. Um, John Wesley would have had two arms and all legs up in the arm air for that voice. Um, he got to the point in his pursuit of holiness and was so concerned about being perfect as God is perfect that not only did he record his visitations his conversations his readings in his journal he started not just keeping a journal but an exactor diary where every single hour of the day that he was awake he would go and record the resolutions that he had kept and that he had broken he would write the state of his soul on a scale from one to nine and his attentiveness, and there are lots of other things, too. We're not going to talk about that kind of perfectionism, okay? Um, we're going to take a deep breath and let that pass through, because as John Wesley whipped himself up into a frenzy trying to become perfect with this hourly exactor diary, he even backed off saying, the very thing that I thought could help me move through and beyond these sins and these faults is actually so keeping them ever before me, that's all there is. Because I haven't given myself any space. So for those of you freaking out right now around this definition of perfection, that's not what we're talking about. So now can we all be back together in an imperfect world? Okay. All right. Who are my science buffs in here who can tell me what the law of entropy is? High school? Yep. Everything in motion is always in motion, and that motion always tends toward... Chaos, disorder, all things tend toward disorder into chaos. So this is one of the best things that a spiritual director, me, type A perfectionist, has ever heard because I'm just going to go forward and I'm going to keep pushing forward. And I'm going to keep working. If I just get over this bump, then I'm going to keep getting there. Um, if all things tend toward disorder, we don't live on a planar laying, playing field. That's not the way life works. It's much messier than that. And that's the most terrifying thing one of us perfectionists can hear because it's out of our control. But it's also one of the most beautiful things. And I can't stop thinking about Toby and all of the weavings that she is working in this art piece that she's been completing because this is the perfection that we're talking about. The perfection of imperfection, of a world where there are tons of failures, of a world where we will be damaged and we will be hurt in a world where we will be the ones doing the harming and the hurting, but a world with a God that not one of those experiences, not one moment, not anything or anyone will be wasted. So when we come to trying to pursue God's holiness and God's perfection, and we immediately get out a pair of scissors to cut out all the bad parts that we don't want people to see and put them on the floor and make, make a different kind of weaving that we can present to the world, we have just started to live a lie. We have just held the very pieces from God that God can bring the most power and the most redemption from. And when we cut out that power, and we, and we cut out that possibility, we leave God nothing to work with. 
we leave God with a love that is shallow, that everyone else in this world knows, because of course we can love people who are lovable or who are like us or who haven't failed however we define that. But our witness as Christians, our testimony is a God who gathers up every single one of those pieces and weaves them and brings truth and brings redemption and brings life that that is perfect that is holy and that is beautiful so we have a decision of who we are as christians and how we live life in the pursuit of holiness. I've just come back from a conference in North Carolina that you guys are gonna be hearing about for a really long time, so get ready, because it was amazing. Um, but the piece that I will share now is this conference was called Why Christian? And all it was was eight different speakers getting up and giving their testimony of why they are Christian. And every single one had a story of how they had been harmed and how they had been broken, many by the church itself. And almost every single one said the very moment when I should have been the most broken and left the Christian church because of what they did, I stayed because of the Christians who were there and who were conspiring to save me. So are we going to be the Christians that bring other people's faith into a crisis and a question of whether or not they can continue in the church for the harm being done? Or, whether, or are we going to be the Christians that are there, that are showing love, love not just of friends and those we, who love us, but love for our enemies? Love in a way that shows that the impossible can be possible. Love that saves us and lifts us up when we should be reduced to dust and ash. That's the question that I want to keep before us today. And that love comes in seeing each other. And in living into a love that God sees us in all of the weavings, all of the lines that we're proud of and all the lines it takes everything in us to not cut and rip out and hide and tuck away. I want us to be whole and I want us to know the glory that is in that kind of weaving. John Wesley, um, as he was dying and reflecting on Methodism, writes this in his journal. Afterwards, I met this society where he was preaching because he never stopped preaching. Uh, let's, just, let's just call the perfectionism what it is. He gave up the exactor diary, but he didn't give up this. And I explained to them at, the lar at large the original design of the Methodists, namely not to be a distinct party, not to be a distinct denomination, but to stir up all parties Christians or heathens, to worship God in spirit and in truth. But the Church of England in particular, to which they belonged from the beginning. With this view, I have uniformly gone on for 50 years, never varying from the doctrine of the church at all, not from her discipline of choice, but of necessity. So we actually did vary from the doctrine. Not of choice, but of necessity. So in the course of years, necessity was laid upon me, as I have proved elsewhere, to teach in the open air, to take the gospel out of churches and into the fields where the people were, to pray extempore. That's all we do usually here, so that sounds really odd to us, but that was a change. To form societies, small groups, and to accept of the assistance of lay preachers, the priesthood of all believers that lay and clergy alike, we are all in this and are all called. And in a few other instances, to use such means as occurred to prevent or remove evils that either we felt or feared. 
So may we go through this life looking at all the pieces and all of the weavings, not separating out the truth that we think is okay, but putting it all together because God might just show us a new piece of truth that we need for the salvation of our souls and that we can be in a place to be the Christians that are conspiring to save others. Truth is a beautiful and a hard thing. And that is what shines through Psalm 51. As David is asked to confront a truth, he is cut out and ignored. As Nathan comes at it sideways because he knows David has this compartmentalized and tucked away, and if he asks direct on, then David's going to have all of that lined up and ready to go. But instead, he tells him a story about somebody else. And David is able to see differently and to see with empathy. And then, when Nathan turns that story around and says, you are that man, then David's compartmentalization shatters, and he sees the full evil and the full harm of what he has done. And to David's credit, he doesn't cut it out and leave it on the floor anymore, but picks it up and weaves it in. And there's going to be a lot more pain and a lot more mistakes that happen on down the line. But this is the witness of what we do. And we are at a place in our church where we need this desperately. Because we are at a place in our church where we're way more comfortable with tucking sin away and compartmentalizing it and pretending it's not there and like it's not affecting anyone or impeding our ability to witness to Jesus Christ. Nothing could be more harmful or more wrong. My girlfriend's colleagues and I, as we were going down, had an entire three-hour car ride of venting of the way that things have come up in our conference, the sins that have been allowed to continue even when brought to attention. This past week, I found out that my former senior pastor was charged with sexual immorality for having an affair with a parishioner. And there are others in this conference that have not even been brought up in charges but are allowed to continue in leadership positions while conversations and conferences or studies on boundaries are given to everyone else without being acted upon. When we do this, we cannot love or witness to God's salvation fully or completely or helpfully or without harm. Sin is real. And God will pick up the pieces and God will weave them in and God will bring forward a new way. But that won't happen if we don't name it. That won't happen if we're not honest about the harm that we have caused and repent from it and offer it to God for redemption. Otherwise, it will continue to fester and grow and eat away and destroy others' ability to find faith and find support in a community to make this journey. John Wesley said of the Methodist Church, I am not afraid that the people called Methodists should, never, should ever cease to exist, either in Europe or America. They're always going to exist. We've gotten to the place where Methodists are here. But I am afraid lest they should only exist as a dead sect, having the form of religion but without the power. And this undoubtedly will be the case unless they hold fast both the doctrine, spirit, and discipline with which they first set out. And this is why we're doing small groups here. So in the opening prayer, so that everyone may have a safe space to come forward for support and for accountability. So that we can bring, Sujay, our troubles to Jesus and to the church and name them and have them transformed so that they are troubles no longer. 
when three people this week come and ask me about small groups and their purpose and how to go deeper. This is the deeper we are talking about, to name where we wrestle, to name where we mess up, and to ask one another to hold us accountable so just as we for- receive the forgiveness of Christ as the woman who is about to be stoned, so we also go forward to sin no more. I want us to be the people that pick up what we would rather cut out and give them to God to weave, to make a witness that is so powerful that anyone looking at will ask how. How can you love like that? How can you live like that? How can you take something that would break you and instead make it your strength? How can you take something like the harm that you have done and not shrink away and say that's it, but still claim life and an ability to take a new step and move forward again that you still have a place that you don't have to write yourself out of? We talked about the people that John Wesley kicked out of the Newcastle Society for drunkenness, for beating their wives, for perpetual lying, for laxness and carelessness. What we didn't talk about is the process that John Wesley set up so that as he kept those people outside of the small group meetings and the gatherings and those were going on to perfection, there was another group and process for them. And Easter Sunday was the time that people who had been separated for their sins and asked to repent and work through that process of claiming and confession of Psalm 51, of getting, of being created in a new heart and a new spirit, were then brought back in to the community. That's what I want to find together. A way that we don't shy away from the harm that sin causes. A way to name it a way to name all of the harm that can topple over and ripple out, but also a way to name that that person is also as much loved by God as we are. And that just as we pray, may we be healed. May we also be a source of healing for others. And in the Easter resurrection connection, where we all come back together, to be woven into the same fabric again. May there be a witness. May there be a completion. May there be a love that brings forth life from death and wholeness from brokenness. Amen.